Hello friends and welcome back to the channel. This video is about ECGs that you must remember, memorize because they will help you in difficult situations. No matter if you're an MBBS student or you're a practicing doctor, these ECGs are important. And especially if you're preparing for postgraduate entrance exams like the PG, one of these ECGs would be there on the exam. Okay, so because these are the most important ECGs. So let's get started. Now, there is no particular sequence in which we can learn ECGs, as I tell uh, in my previous videos also, that ECG recognition is about pattern recognition. There's a set of specific rules that if you follow, ECG is easy then, okay? So let's start with this ECG. Now, um, what you need to recognize is the ST segment elevation. Why? Because this is something that you cannot afford to miss. Somebody presenting with chest pain with this ECG, and if you're a doctor, an MBBS doctor, a physician, a surgeon, whosoever you are, you should be able to recognize this. Now take a look at this ST, the, the point where the QRS meets the ST segment. Look how elevated it is from the baseline, right? So this is ST elevation. Okay, so ST elevation in the leads 2, 3, and AVF. So this is an inferior wall, ST elevation MI, and you can also appreciate ST segment depressions in the mirror image leads, the high lateral leads, lead 1, lead AVL have depression. Okay, so this is inferior wall, ST elevation myocardial infarction. Easy just look at the st segment elevations now remember st segment elevations occur in different territories if it's an inferior wall myocardial infarction it will occur in leads 2 3 avf if it was an anterior wall myocardial infarction then the elevation would be in the anterior precordial leads which will be lead v1 v2 v3 v4 or v6 right as we'll see in the next ECG. So this ECG was that of an inferior wall MI. Now what you see here is again the same concept. You see the ST segment is elevated about the baseline, ST segment is elevated about the baseline, again elevated about the baseline, elevated about the baseline. Now this is a case of anterior wall myocardial infarction because the ST segment elevations are in the anterior precordial leads, that's V1 to V4, some subtle elevation in V5 also. So this is a case of anterior wall ST elevation MI. An important tip here, if in a case of anterior wall MI, you find a right bundle branch block. So this is a right bundle branch block also in a patient of anterior wall MI, it means it's a high risk case. It means the patient has had a large infarct. It means he's at risk of death, okay? So remember, right bundle branch block in the setting of anterior wall MI is an extremely high risk patient. And usually, when we do angiography in these patients, very proximal LAD is occluded, okay? So the most important vessel in the heart, LAD, is occluded in these patients. So this was a case of anterior wall MI. So why I presented these ECGs at the start? Because you cannot afford to miss the diagnosis of myocardial infarction. There's no way you can miss it because these patients need urgent treatment. Okay, and these this is easy to remember. Just there's no big deal in recognizing that the ST segment is up. ST segment is up, so it's easy. Now, this ECG, this ECG is different. Again, an ECG of a patient who is presented with chest pain, but in this ECG, you don't see clear-cut ST elevations. In fact, you see ST depression. See, the ST is depressed. 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 In fact, in majority of the leads, you see that the ST is depressed, with one exception, that is lead AVR. Now, in lead AVR, you're seeing elevation. Now, remember, if in a case of chest pain, you see this ECG, AVR is elevated and majority of the other leads have ST segment depression. AVR, ST segment elevation, remaining of the leads, ST segment depression, this is an extremely high risk ECG. Because this means that this patient has either a left main that is diseased or very proximal LAD which is diseased 
or all three vessels of the heart are diseased. Here's an example of an ECG of a patient who had left main occlusion, left main occlusion. So you can see ST segment elevation in the lead AVR and then diffuse ST segment depressions in all the remaining leads, one, two, three AVF, V2 to V6, they're depressed and AVR is elevated. So please remember, this will be categorized as an STMI, non-ST segment elevation MI, but this is a high risk patient, okay? Right. So next uh, ECG is something like this. Again, you cannot afford to miss this ECG. Why? If you don't recognize this ECG pattern, this can be hazardous. Patient can die. Okay. So here, uh, a characteristic tall peaked T waves. You see the T waves and they're, they're never normally so tall and peaked, tall and peaked, tall and peaked. Always remember tall and peaked T waves point to something hyperkalemia, electrolyte abnormalities, okay? Now, this patient's hyperkalemia was not suspected, potassium went even further high. So what happens next after those tall and peak T waves? So you have here tall and peak T waves. The next step is QRS starts to broaden, P wave starts to diminish, okay? May disappear. The QRS prolongs, 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 and then the ECGs look like this. So you have tall peak T waves and QRS prolongation, right? So QRS is prolonged and it actually overlaps T wave, it overlaps the preceding P wave also. So these ECGs are important and if you don't correct potassium here, the ECGs can really look very bizarre. So this is like a stretched out ECG with very broad, bizarre looking QRSs. So if you see such ECGs, get worried, okay? Check potassium. This is a lethal form of an ECG. And remember the simple diagram, hypokalemia causes ST segment depressions, T wave inversions, and prominent U waves. On the other hand, hyperkalemia causes tall and peak T waves, QRS prolongation and disappearance of P waves. Okay. This ECG again, it can predispose to a lethal outcome. So what's abnormal here? You see a normal P, QRST, P, QRST looks okay. P, QRST, P, QRST. The ST segments are neither elevated nor depressed. Then what is wrong? What is wrong here is the QT interval. From the start of the QRS complex, to the end of the T, look how prolonged it is. From the start of the QRS complex to the end of the T, this is the prolonged QT. If you have been following my channel, I've, I've, I've had previous videos on how to interpret ECGs and there's one video on QT interval assessment. You see, I've mentioned there also that if the QT, so from the start of the Q to the end of the T, if it actually exceeds half of the RR interval, you should be worried that this is likely a prolonged QT. But otherwise, in most of these CGs, you should be checking the corrected QT interval using the Bayes' formula, okay? So remember, QT prolongation can lead to fatal arrhythmias. And there are different causes of prolonged QT, including electrolyte abnormalities, like hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia. So always, whenever you have some bizarre ECGs, check electrolytes, check potassium, check magnesium, check calcium, okay? Myocardial ischemia is, is a very important cause of prolonged QT. So is congenital long QT syndrome, and so are cert certain drugs, especially commonly used amiodarone drug. So what, I, um, so what we've discussed so far is how you recognize myocardial infarction and how you recognize electrolyte abnormalities, right? These are treatable causes. You can treat someone's hypokalemia and prevent him from dying from a fatal ventricular arrhythmia like Torsat's deep pons, okay? Now, so what do you see in this ECG? This ECG is also characteristic. You see what is known as QRS alternance, right? One QRS interval is tall, other QRS interval is short, tall, short, tall, short, high amplitude, low amplitude. This is QRS alternance, right? Electrical alternance. Why is it important? Because this signals pericardial tamponade, okay? So QRS alternance or electrical alternance suggests pericardial tamponade. Another ECG that's not so easy to recognize, but in a given context, you should actively look for this pattern. For example, somebody with a history of prolonged immobilization crashes suddenly, sudden dyspnea, hypotension, and you suspect pulmonary embolism. You should be looking on an ECG for the sign. You look at the deep S waves in the lead one, the Q waves, 
in the lead 3 and T inversion in the lead 3, the so-called S1, Q3, T3 sign. Look, this is present in maybe 10 or 20% of patients of acute pulmonary embolism. But when it's present, it's very specific for strained RV, RV strain, acute RV strain, acute core pulmonal in a given context of pulmonary embolism. Okay, by the way, the most common feature of pulmonary embolism on ECG is not this pattern. It's just present in 10, 20%. The most common feature is sinus tachycardia, which could itself be in my uh, NMCQ exam. Now, we move on to another very important set of ECGs. A few of these ECGs, and one of these ECGs is always there in the NEAT PG or INICT exam. Now here, of course, you appreciate the ST elevation. That's clear, that's taken, ST elevation only 2, 3, and AVF. This patient does have inferior wall myocardial infarction, but that's not why this ECG is here. You see that there's actually no correlation between the P waves and the QRS complexes. This P wave is not conducted. This is not conducted because look at the differences in the PR intervals. This cannot be a normal AV conduction. This patient, in fact, has a complete heart block where none of the P waves are actually conducted to the ventricle and the ventricular rhythm is a different rhythm. Now, this may be a little, little difficult to establish on this particular ECG, but this is what you're looking for. You're looking for AV dissociation where P waves are running on their own rhythm. Some of them are overlapping QRS complexes. Some of them may be overlapping T waves of the, pre of the, of the, QRS, of the QRS complexes, but they're independent of the ventricular rate. The ventricular rate is slow, generally like 40 or 30, something like that. So in this particular ECG, atrial rate is around 100, the ventricular rate is just around 40, okay? This is an easy ECG to remember. This is again complete heart block. So this one was little difficult to appreciate. This one, it was little difficult to appreciate. But this one, something like this is easy. It's not conducted. P wave not conducted, not conducted, not conducted, and then ventricular escape. P wave not conducted, not conducted. This patient has a very slow ventricular escape, must be having syncope, and unless an emergency pacemaker is put, temporary pacemaker is put, this patient may have asystole and die. So now you have actually covered AV blocks, the most important one being complete heart block, right? Okay. Now this ECG is fast, it's tachycardia, the QRS complex is narrow, so this is a narrow QRS complex tachycardia. It is regular, so the RR intervals are roughly the same. It's regular. I'm not able to appreciate a P wave. This, rather, actually, you see a P wave just after QRS complex in the lead V1, right? So this type of an ECG, regular narrow complex tachycardia, should make you think of SVT, supraventricular tachycardias, like atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardias or AV reciprocating tachycardias, AVNRT or AVRT, basically a PSVT, not a lethal problem, but <laughs> patients do present to emergencies, patients do present with palpitations, patients do present with these ECGs, and a prompt recognition can lead to an early diagnosis, reassurance, and starting of the treatment of these patients, right? Now, this is different. This is again tachycardia. This is again an error complex tachycardia, but look, see the difference. This is irregular. You again have very hard time in looking for P waves. You don't see any regular P waves here. So this ECG, the difference from this ECG is that this one was narrow, this one was regular narrow complex tachycardia versus this is an irregular, irregularly regular narrow complex tachycardia. You're not able to appreciate any P waves. So this is atrial fibrillation. Again, important to recognize why? Because if you don't recognize this problem, then patients with risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, old age, and this particular ECG will be at risk of stroke. So recognizing this ECG, starting the optimum anticoagulation can prevent a stroke in a patient, which is why this ECG is there in the presentation. Very important to understand atrial fibrillation. By the way, the most common arrhythmia in adults is atrial fibrillation. How easy it is to recognize atrial fibrillation, right? Look at the ECGs. The QRS complexes are irregularly irregular you're not able to clearly find out a P wave. You're having a hard time. See, you might say, okay, there are some deflections here. Okay, these are, these are, these are F waves, fibrillatory waves, right? You don't see clear-cut P waves in 
all the leads. And this pattern, these are regular, different morphology, small undulations. These are known as fibrillatory waves and not P waves. You clearly don't see any P waves in the rest of the ECG. You clearly see that the RR intervals are irregular. So this is an ECG of atrial fibrillation. Another simpler ECG, again, narrow QRS complexes. You're not able to find P waves and the rhythm is irregularly irregular. So what's the diagnosis? Atrial fibrillation, the most common arrhythmia in adults, atrial fibrillation. Now this tachycardia, but now not narrow complex. Now it's a wide complex tachycardia. These QRS complexes are very broad. This tachycardia is regular, wide complex tachycardia. One important diagnosis, because this can kill a patient in minutes. This is ventricular tachycardia ventricular tachycardia, a monomorphic VT, same ECG, similar ECG here, white complex regular tachycardia, this is monomorphic VT until proven otherwise, okay? An important tip here, these ECGs usually have AVR positive, okay? Remember in VT, you have a northwest axis, extreme axis deviation, okay? Now here, this is also a case of VT, a white complex tachycardia, but remember, and see that the QRS complexes have different morphologies and they actually appear to twist around a middle point. They're positive, they're negative here, they become positive here, they have different morphologies. This is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And in the setting of a prolonged QT interval, this patient actually had hypokalemia. Remember, just a simple problem, an adult patient, an elderly patient may be on diuretics. Very common patients on diuretics for hypertension, for heart failure, for whatever indication patients are on diuretics, they have low potassium, they have this ECG abnormality which is on the left side of the ECG. They have hypokalemia and prominent U waves. They have, sorry, QT prolongation and prominent U waves. This patient had a potassium of three, QT prolonged, prominent U waves, and then that predisposes to a polymorphic VT, which is known as torsade steepons, lethal arrhythmia. So through these ECGs, I've tried to cover most important ECGs that you need to know that if you recognize in a particular patient, you can save somebody's life. I hope it's been of value to you. Thanks, and do keep subscribing to the channel and supporting my videos. Thank you.